Are we seeing a presentation now, Kat? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, in fact, Rosanna's nodding. She's seen this photograph before. Look, I put this up because normally uh, when I get to talk, uh, I'm normally stood at the front. You can get a size of me, see what's going on. Uh, but over this, of course, you don't. So you can see me here. I've got um, a couple of prosthetic legs going on and a bit of balancing, no hands going on. Now, how did I get to there? So um, I'm going to let a chap called Amal Rajan, who has become more and more famous since he met me on the radio. Um, sorry, the other way around. Um, so it, he invited um, my wife, Julie, and I onto Radio 2. He was sitting in for the Jeremy Vine show, and this was organised through meningitis research. Um, let's get his introduction of what went on with me, and I'm hoping this audio comes through. So here we go. I'm about to speak with a man who lost his hands and legs to meningitis. On Christmas Eve 2017, Mike Davies was wrapping the last of his presents at his home in Brighton when he began to feel unwell. He was getting colder and colder. Mike put on a coat, then a blanket, he even tried getting under the duvet. Nothing worked, he was still freezing. When he went downstairs to try and join in with the family Christmas celebrations, they were alarmed. Well, to put it mildly, he was so pale, his lips had turned blue, and despite Mike's protest, his family insisted that he went to Royal Sussex County Hospital immediately. And it was just as well. When he got there, staff realised something was drastically wrong. He was moved from A&E to triage to intensive care in quick succession. Doctors discovered that he had bacterial meningitis, and they had to act quickly. They gave him antibiotics, but sepsis had already started affecting his limbs. When doctors held Mike's hands, he couldn't feel anything. His hands and feet were dying. He spent 10 weeks in hospital, heavily medicated and on the edge of survival. Nurses had told Mike's wife and son that he was not going to make it. But he did. When he finally came to, doctors said that if he had any chance of surviving, his hands and his legs had to be amputated. At the time, Mike was so desperate to live that he looked forward to getting rid of the infected areas. He went he underwent surgery soon after and had months of video to learn to walk on prosthetic legs and use prosthetic hands. Well, since then, he's made a remarkable and inspirational recovery and a busy living life to the full. He wants people to know there's hope after meningitis. And I'm honoured and humbled to say that he joins me now in the studio with his wife, Julie. It's very good to see you both. Oh, Amal, thank, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, just at the outset, my son said yesterday, make sure you're on radio, Mike. Describe how you look, because you won't get it otherwise. So just very quickly, sure. um, as we look at me, uh, my arms run out on the right arm. It runs out at the wrist, so there's no hand beyond the wrist. On the left arm, it's four or five inches short because the se sepsis caught more of me. So I've got one arm longer than the other, no hands. And uh, the way my son put it was because he got chopped off. Um, so same for my legs in that uh, we were managed to stay uh, the knee, but not much more below the knee. Uh, the sep sepsis rose up my knee like, uh, like a, a black Wellington, if you like. And uh, so I had to have those removed as well. So hopefully I'm back on audio, but um, that was uh, an introduction as to how I got into intensive care. Um, and many on this call may have been through similar um, experiences, I know. Um, but um, as I look back at these photographs, I still find them quite um, alarming. Um, my son said that I had something like 27 tubes sticking in and out of me. Um, but I was the lucky one in that for 10 weeks in intensive care, I was in a coma, so it was my wife and my son who who lived through it and who were told, look, go in and tell Mike what you need to tell him because he's not going to make it. So they had the torrid time. Now, I won't dwell too much on this because this is about life after limb loss and about some of the psychological aspects. But um, sometime after intensive care, I've had my amputations. So one week, my legs, the next week, my hands, seven hours in the operating theatre to have the hands removed. Um, and I like this photograph because I'm thinking, what on earth am I doing smiling? You know, what, what am I thinking? And what I was really thinking at the time, and it plays into, 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 this, uh, into this talk, is I was thinking, how can I possibly be the best version of me going forward? What can I do to lift some of the burden from my family and friends? So I was determined at the outset, even sat there, that I would try and get up and walk and act and do and do as much as I could without hands, without with my limb loss. So really, that's what this story is about. So after hospital and healing, 
and, and some recovery. Uh, it was off to Roehampton to a specialist um, centre for learning to walk again with prosthetic legs. And I, I love to put this picture up because these were four of my about 11 buddies or patients there. Everybody else had, everybody else actually had lost a leg. I, I was the only one who'd lost hands and it meant that I'd got an electric wheelchair, which is brilliant for me. But it was quite a walk or quite a wheelchair ride to, to the gym each day. We did six hours in the gym, getting core developed, getting used to walking on prosthetic legs. So in the morning, Mike at the front, everybody would tag along the back like this and four or five of us would snake through the um, Roehampton Centre, it's a kind of a hospital, 400 yards up to, up to the gym area and loads of laughter, it's brilliant. But the deal here is that those were my buddies and at night, well, night, early, late afternoon, after we'd done the gym, we would talk through what, what was it all about? What did this mean? What was happening to us? What would happen in the future? Um, so there was a lot of the psychological, if you like, going on in those early days with help. In the training around this, I had, I had the most incredible, I'm looking at Kate in the middle here, uh, ex-rower, ex-athlete, um, phenomenal belief she had in, in her patients and in me. Here, she's got me sat on a, a big ball. Remember, I haven't got hands and I haven't got legs. And if I fall off the ball, I have broken something or something of what's left. It, it is, you know, this was at any point, the safety aspect of this was don't do it. But Kate had belief in me and put me through this, got me balanced, just using my core. I know Brian here at the front can do it, but he's an ex-gymnast, so, but I, lovely. My thanks to Kate and the belief. So I got myself, sorry, people worked at me getting uh, better to the point that finally borrowing Kate's uh, trainers, size eight, um, I was able to stand up in my first set of prosthetic legs. And this is the photo that when it did the rounds of the family and the friends, this is when the tears came because there's Mike, up again, all right, you know, on plastic feet, but he's up. I look as skinny as a rake. Um, do you know, it's just caught my eye. It, there's a little bit protruding on my chest there and that's my dialysis connections. I was on dialysis at the time, but no longer, which is a, a terrific, terrific thing. So physically, cool, mentally, I want to read you something that will be familiar, I think, to uh, my friends in the Meningitis Research Foundation. You'll get this on meningitis.org. It's it's an extract from a blog and it is the psychological impact of limb loss. I just want to read you to this too, and we have got time, this blog extract. So in a hospital, my goal was to recover and to heal and to be as fit as possible, ready for rehabilitation. A focus that lifted my spirits and my fantastic wife, Julie, also lifted my spirits enormously by visiting me for 111 days on the trot in hospital. It's a grieving process when you lose a limb. You grieve for the loss of it and for what you can no longer do. And everyone's grieving is a little different and takes as long as is necessary. I can now see the often listed, listen, listed stages of what I went through, the denial that anything had actually happened, the anger that it had happened to me, bargaining for the return of a limb, if only I did something better, depression at my situation, and more about that in a moment. And yes, eventually, acceptance. And, and peace with how I am now. And of course, those stages, they didn't just kind of follow one another. It was a roller coaster. So after rehabilitation and learning to walk again, I came home in June 2018. There were adaptions to be made to the house, particularly grab posts to help me up the stairs and the installation of a bio B day, a toilet that gives you that your dignity by washing and drying you after use. Oh, brilliant. But without all the focus on healing and strengthening and learning in the hospital and at rehab, I found the reality at home was very different and very difficult. Tiredness was ever present and my body continued to carry the effects of six months in hospital. I used to sit on the edge of my bed at night. I used to take my legs off and I honestly sat there wondering how I was going to get through the next day. Well, Exhaustion meant I sleep, slept easily, and my dreams were always without limb loss, happily pursuing the activities that had been so natural before. But in the morning, it became more and more tempting just to stay in bed. The warmth, I could feel as though my limbs were still there. 
I could feel safe. I could feel as though nothing had happened to me until reality dawned each day and with the most overwhelming depressive feelings of despair. Sleep for me became an avoidance of reality, whether it was at night or during the daytime. Well, the most greatest thing to happen to me then was that I was offered counselling through the renal department at the hospital and Angela became my guiding angel. It was so good at first just to have a third person, not the family, to listen and share my grieving, to remind me what a huge thing I've been through. Angela would say, your family will still see you just as you were before, not diminished. You've been through a lot and there are many layers to it. She would say, you've lost a lot, including in your case, your employment at the same time. And she said, recognize the depression being there, observe it, you can let it be as it will pass. So with Angela, my counsellor, encouraging me to recognise little victories, each a positive step forward, I also talked with my GP and even to this day I take a really low dose of antidepressants and my depression lifted slowly enough to allow little victories to become the new me. So in my darkest moments I would think, how would I ever shower, toilet, eat breakfast, drink tea, go shopping, walk places, catch a bus? But overcoming each of these challenges was another little victory. I learned to accept my situation and be at peace with it. In fact, I'm actually rather pleased. I promise you, I'm really pleased with the new me. I find I take on greater challenges and I have much more empathy for everyone around me. So, you know, there's lots to experience in life. There's many challenges and I never, ever say, I never say I can't. I always say, how can I? So what do I do? I do go to the gym. I go out on demonstrations and marches and get involved in the community. And I'm in, involved in conservation in Brighton, looking out for all these lovely old buildings we've got. I go and give talks when I can and when I'm invited. Who, who, well, I can't do a show of hands, who, hands but who understands what Wogan is out of Wogan House? That's a bit old, I would say. Um, they're here, again, courtesy of Meningitis Research Foundation. I found myself on the stage at, how cool is this, the British Museum with mm, some hundreds of professors from around the world looking at the sub-Saharan meningitis vaccine programs. And it was Médecins Sans Frontières and it was me, Mike. I, oh, splendid. And in the middle here, this is Julie again and me. We're just waiting to go on to the Amal Rajan uh, piece. The producer said, she said, uh, come over here, I'll show you this. And she whisked a cover off a piano and the piano was signed on the side uh, signed on the side, um, Elton John. So this is Elton John's piano. I, I got to play middle C on Elton John's piano. How cool is that? I think we're still going. I've got some noises just then. Look, just let me say, I got my, I want to talk about my story and I do and I have, and it's gone out in all sorts of places. A bit on ITV, on the television, a little bit on BBC in the South, uh, back on the radio, it got into the newspapers and the Metro there. Um, it is cathartic to be able to talk and the feedback I get is that it's helpful for everyone. It certainly helps me. And what I'm trying to say here is, look at that man at the beginning, but he's up and he's running, he's doing this stuff. You know, I'm even driving. So go back to him with his silly grin and go back to him thinking, what am I going to do? And it's, I never say I can't. I always challenge myself, how can I? And I genuinely do. So here's that picture again. And I'm figuring, how do I get from one step to the next step? And let me press the last button, which is shut up now, Mike, and stop sharing your screen. So that's me done.